Okay, good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm glad to welcome Marina Constantatou from Fosters and Partners for the first guest talk in the frame of our design studio, Versatile Spaces at the Vienna University of Technology. The studio is a joint project between the Department of Building Construction and Design and the Department for Structural Design. And before we hear more about the integration between architecture and engineering on Earth and beyond, from Marina, I will shortly introduce uh, her to you. Marina Constantatu is a researcher of structural design, form finding and architectural geometry. Her interests revolve around the development of theoretical and computational frameworks of geometric based methods for the design and analysis of materially efficient structures in the context of the built environment. Marina is particularly interested in the cross-disciplinary application of her research to a wide range of subjects spanning from reinforced concrete to extraterrestrial structural design. Her background is in applied mathematics and physics, after which she specialized in computational design at the Emergent Technologies and Design Master Program at BAA and in Civil Engineering at the University of Cambridge. Marina holds a PhD from the University of Cambridge on geometry-based structural analysis and design, for which she also won the University CESA Award, which is an award for outstanding research with real-world application. Currently, she holds a research and a position at Fosters and Partners in the Specialist Modeling Group. Uh, Marina, welcome to our design studio. We're happy to hear your talk today and we're also looking forward to hear your input on the students' projects next week. Welcome, thank you very much. Thank you very much for the invitation. It's uh, great to be here and um, give a talk. Um, so let me see how I can share my screen first. Okay. Actually, can you see my full screen now? Not yet. Okay, let's see. Better now? Um, I cannot see anything. Ah. Okay, let's try this again. Now? Not yet. Ah, oh, yes, yes, I can see it. Perfect. Okay, great. Um, right, so um, thank you very much for the introduction, Sandra. Um, so, uh, yeah, my name is Marina, and uh, I'm quite keen on structural design and generally on the integration between uh, form and design with uh, the performance and the analysis. Uh, so first, oops, uh, just a few uh, more words about my background, uh, just to illustrate where my uh, interest came from. So um, I have a background in mathematics, uh, and then I was very interested also in engineering uh, and in computational design. So um, basically what happened was that at first I, designed, uh, I studied mathematics and then I was very interested in geometry and I thought, okay, maybe I should apply that to architecture or, or architectural design. Uh, so then I went to the AA, and, uh, which was very interesting, but then I felt that good design is also related to uh, performance and analysis. Uh, so maybe I should study a bit more um, and particularly study civil engineering and structural analysis and then see how all those three can sort of come together. So 
Uh, for me, that intersection where these things come together is a structural design, form finding, and architectural geometry. And the uh, research I'm going to present to you now uh, is uh, mostly for the first part, my PhD research, which was uh, in collaboration with uh, my supervisor in Cambridge, Alan McCroby, uh, and also with Skidro, Skidmore uh, Owings in Merrill, uh, with Bill Baker, um, also at, with uh, ETH Zurich with Pierluigi da Kunto and uh, at the uh, University of Pennsylvania with uh, Masoud at Barzadem. Um, so just to give some uh, more back, uh, background in my research, uh, what we started looking at was graphic statics. So uh, graphic statics, uh, as you might know, is a 19th century design and analysis methodology uh, for trusses in static equilibrium. And it's very, very visual and very intuitive. So you can really see what is the form and what is the force and what is the uh, interplay between those. But um, we started looking into 19th century uh, and specifically uh, into natural philosophers, let's say, or, um, or people like Poncelet, who was a mathematician back then, and he's credited with um, really founding projective geometry and also uh, Bidel Airy, which at the time was actually the Astronomer Royal at Greenwich in London. Uh, but more importantly, we were very interested in the work of Maxwell. So Maxwell is really well known about his contribution to electromagnetism and uh, as, a, as a genius physicist really, but he actually also had a seminal uh, contribution when it comes to structural analysis and design. And what I would like to highlight is that um, all those people we just saw, and, and many more uh, of their contemporaries, they, they really had intrinsically a, a multidisciplinary approach to things. So back then they were more like natural philosophers and, and, and they had like a very wide span and, and breadth of, and depth of what they were thinking and uh, the theories they were developing. So their thinking was quite analytical and abstract, and they did develop uh, direct mathematical frameworks and fundamental theory uh, and cross-disciplinarity, as we say, if you see what Maxwell worked on is, uh, is absolutely stunning from telephones to physics to you name it. And for me, something to really take from that time is the understanding of first principles. So nowadays we have really fantastic computational tools that they do allow us to experiment a lot and do all those generative design examples. But at the same time, I think it's important not to forget that we, we really need to understand in depth um, what are all those first principles behind those. Um, so just a few words about uh, graphic static. So, um, Started, actually started uh, uh, before the uh, 19th century, but maybe that was the peak of the method. Um, so you have this notion of form and force. So in those drawings here, you see reciprocal diagrams. So a two-dimensional truss can be uh, just depicted as a form diagram. And then with uh, geometrical manipulations, you can find the force, its force diagram. So, um, its bar of the form diagram is basically just like a beam or a truss member. And then the force diagram, the length of its edge is actually the axial force. So you can really see how big are the forces. And uh, why this is also uh, quite interesting is that by changing something in either the form or the force, the other diagram is updated as well. So those are interlinked. So you can uh, play around with the form and see what happens with the forces. And more importantly, you can start designing with the forces and see what is the form that is gonna emerge and which is in static equilibrium. Uh, but as you might suspect from the drawing on the right, if you wanted to uh, draw something a bit more complicated, that required quite tedious hand drawing. And uh, what is more is that imagine now uh, in the table on the right, if you wanted to slightly change something and make a variation, you would have to draw everything from the beginning. So um, graphic statics uh, decayed a bit, I think, uh, at the start of the 20th century, but at the same time, 
the, the, they were um, they were still uh, applied from some uh, very important researchers. Um, and what we see here is a is a famous paper by Mitchell on the economy of uh, trusses, and you see those very beautiful uh, forms emerging, and the thing is that behind them, behind their geometry, you have uh, this notion of efficiency. So this geometry is the direct result of the truss being very efficient, actually. And you have this beautiful sort of uh, philotaxis pattern on the right. Um, so even though graphic statics uh, sort of uh, uh, were not very popular as they were uh, in the 19th century, during the 20th century, they, they did survive a bit. And specifically in the context of structural morphogenesis. So here we see a very nice example of, uh, of a bridge by Maillard. And what he did, uh, as you can see at the diagram at the bottom was that with graphic statics, he started experimenting with his drawings to uh, find the resulting form of the bridge. And something to mention is that uh, if I'm not wrong, I think he did three or four drawings um, uh, as iterations of the design only. Uh, whereas today with our computational tools would be so much easier uh, to do uh, studies and slightly change things and see what happens and all that. But as we said before, it's important to keep in mind that we should try to have both. So this ability to iterate and explore a lot, but at the same time, really understand um, what is happening and why we're doing it. Uh, so uh, this is a, a great example, I think, of a materially efficient structure. So that's uh, uh, King's College Chapel in uh, Cambridge, University of Cambridge. So if you uh, are in the area, I really recommend to go and see the structure. It's a really beautiful um, uh, fan uh, ceiling, uh, masonry roof. So that was built, if I'm not wrong, uh, 16th century. So back then, the, the professions were very different to what they are now. So we didn't, they didn't have back then the specializations that we, we now have and the boundaries between professions. So the architect and the engineer and the craftsman were, I, I think, pretty much the, the same person. They didn't have these very concrete uh, district, distinctions that we have today. Um, however, that as a result had the, the structural performance was really interlinked with the architectural form. And that could lead uh, to material efficiency, uh, like in this example we see now. However, today things are different. So the architect, the engineer and the craftsman, they're normally different people. And it's a bit uh, difficult sometimes for them to communicate and understand each other. Uh, moreover, the structural performance uh, today is not really interlinked with the architectural form. This means that sometimes what can happen is that the, the architects can uh, design a form and then they give that to the structural engineer. And then the structural engineer is expected to do something for the form to stand. Um, however, this uh, discrepancy between the two can lead to material inefficiency. So uh, what can we do and uh, what shall we do? And uh, one of the possible avenues that uh, have really sprung recently is uh, this uh, re-emergence of graphic statics. And this is because graphic statics really interlinks, as we saw, the, the form and the force and in a really visual way. So maybe the way for architects and engineers to be able to communicate more is a common language. And that common language could be the visual language of geometry. And if you're interested in graphic statics, um, I do encourage you to see the literature at the moment because it's a really rapidly uh, evolving field uh, with computational frameworks, uh, theoretical frameworks as well, and uh, quite a lot of researchers working on this. Um, so what I'm gonna present to you today is a particular approach in graphic statics. And this approach is uh, really uh, based on the concept of uh, duality. So what this means is that geometrical elements map to each other. So here on the left, we see, let's say, a form diagram at the top and the force diagram at the bottom, and those two are reciprocal. So here we have this mapping between vertices at the top and faces at the bottom, and also between edges. 
So form edges that we saw before map to force edges. And there are a number of ways where you can do those mappings. And uh, the one I used was uh, that concept of polarities, which is actually described from Poncelet. So it's a sort of 19th century mathematical uh, construction of how we can map uh, geometry to each other. So this is the main uh, construction. So if you start uh, with a polyhedron, then you can map this polyhedron to a dual one. And then if you project those down, you end up with this reciprocal form and force diagram. And as you uh, can see on the left, if you start moving things, so move uh, the nodes or the faces, uh, then automatically uh, all the other diagrams are gonna change as well because everything is interconnected. And this duality concept uh, has also um, been applied to um, more things than uh, form and force diagrams. So for instance, uh, there are examples in literature where by using those dualities, you can transform structures to each other. So sometimes you might have designed something like a tensegri team, and without knowing it, you have also designed another structure like a grillage. So this is also something interesting to keep in mind that you might want to use this type of dualities to go from one type of structure uh, into another by just designing one of the, uh, of the two. Um, so here is the main idea. So uh, that is that if you take a two-dimensional truss for it to be in static equilibrium, so you have axial forces and static equilibrium in every node, then that is a projection of a plane-faced polyhedron. And this polyhedron is a, what is called an airy stress function. So the curvature of the polyhedron basically encodes geometrically the structural performance um, of the truss. And uh, why, why is this important? Um, so if you want to start designing a 2D structure and you want this to be in static equilibrium and materially efficient and have no bending and only axial forces, or for example, you want to start designing the, the roof of a stadium. How can you know that what you design uh, is, as we said, um, in, in static equilibrium? And a simple way is to make sure it's a projection of a polyhedron. And that can actually save you a lot of time because you don't need to go through uh, scripting optimization routines. Uh, you can just do it purely geometrically and actually quite simply. So in relation to that, uh, I'm sure you're aware of this uh, beautiful tensile structure. Um, um, lift uh, a two-dimensional structure in 3D uh, and then results in a, in a spatial structure, which is also in static equilibrium. So we can use the two ideas in conjunction. Um, so um, as we saw before, we have this concept of the polyhedral airy stress function, which is on top of a two-dimensional truss. And the way that you can make this polyhedron actually has a meaning. So you have all those points that you can lift up in the third dimension, but then each one of those actually corresponds to a different state of self-stress. So a, a different condition where this thing can be uh, in equilibrium. So what we can do is that we, we can generate a two-dimensional uh, horizontal equilibrium and then combine that with the force density method to create grid shells, for instance, um, uh, in uh, uh, three-dimensional uh, equilibrium. And the other thing is that by controlling the curvature of the polyhedral stress function, you can actually directly define the load path. So you can explicitly define whether your structure is in compression or in tension, um, and then that can also have an effect because then you can decide about materials. So you can decide which material is good in compression, which one is good in tension, 
and then start combining those in a, in a structural design uh, way. And this is just uh, showing the whole methodology of how you have all those reciprocal uh, elements together and how you can um, lift your two-dimensional structure in a, in a grid shell under vertical loading, which has only axial forces and no bending. Uh, and then another thing is that you can actually combine those form and force diagrams together. So what we see uh, on the right is this sort of hybrid structure where you have rectangles. And those rectangles, they have dimensions force by length. So that also readily gives you um, an idea about your load bus. Um, so as we said, a, a different state of cell stress is actually uh, gonna give you a different form. So in other words, the state of cell stress is a design freedom. So by playing around with your polyhedral area stress function and consequently with your, um, um, with your stresses, you end up with different grid shells on the top. So another way of thinking about it is that if you do freeform design, you could just open Rhino and start sculpting things and moving things around. However, that is gonna most probably result in, in very materially inefficient structures. But you could do uh, sort of, a, of the same thing, but rather in the form space to do that in the force space. So you can start indeed sculpting around and changing things, but then because you're doing it in the force space, you're sure that everything is gonna be in equilibrium. And then the form is gonna emerge as an output rather than as an input. And here are some uh, more complicated examples of uh, this idea, uh, specifically in relation to the great court roof of the British Museum. And uh, as you can see here, if we just start moving a little bit, uh, the, some of the nodes of the uh, polyhedral area stress function that changes uh, the forces. And as a result, we, we can have like a quite, uh, quite crazy and varied uh, different form outputs. And this is just uh, a different load path where in the middle, we actually have a compression ring this time. And then also by changing slightly uh, the stress function, we see how on the top, uh, our form also uh, changed quite wildly, actually. Another thing to mention is that um, this method, which is direct, so you don't need the optimization methods and it uh, does not rely on uh, uh, point reconstruction, um, can also lead to compression-only structures uh, like vaults. So compression-only structures are actually a special case of this. And that happens when this polyhedral area stress function is convex. And then we also generalize that uh, one dimension up. So um, what we saw before, this notion of polarity is in uh, three dimensions. We can actually do that in four dimensions too. So for a three-dimensional truss in static equilibrium, we can think that on top of it, uh, one dimension up, we have those four polytopic, as we would say, stress functions, and we can still map uh, geometrical elements to each other and then project uh, down. And uh, as a result, what we get is these much more uh, intricate structures in 3D. Um, so this time the force diagrams are more like polyhedral structures. So each node of the form diagram of your spatial truss corresponds to, to a cell this time, and its form edge corresponds to a face. So now it's the surface area of this phase that gives you the actual force. And by doing that, you can create a, a, a structural morphology method as well. So by, by sculpting in, in four dimensions, those uh, stress functions and then projecting them down, you can be sure that the result is in static equilibrium. And then when it comes to applications, we were quite interested in uh, reinforced concrete. So how to design uh, discrete stress fields and as we saw this diagram before, what was really crucial was this concept of combining the, the form and the force diagrams together. Um, so uh, as we can see here, we can take an initial strat and tie model 
uh, as our uh, initial truss, let's say. And then if we lift that in 3D to obtain its uh, polyhedral stress function, we then map it and project it down. So then we get the forces. Then we can, can combine those together and we can actually have a direct way of designing our discrete stress field. And these are uh, some examples of a recent paper. And we can also do that for uh, 3D. So this happens again by uh, lifting this uh, special truss in the four dimensions. And this can also apply actually um, to uh, yield line uh, collapse mechanisms. So it's the same idea that uh, if uh, one yield pattern is compatible, then it is a projection of a polyhedron. And then we can also uh, combine the, let's say the reciprocal form and force diagrams uh, in the same way. So then we have a very visual way of uh, expressing the internal work as well as, as the external work uh, for uh, yield line patterns. Um, another thing is that uh, we're also interested in kinematics. So if you have these form and force diagrams, you can uh, make some geometrical rules which actually reveal uh, the displacement vectors for the truss. So here is just a rigid bot motion for this simple case. Um, but here we see uh, a cube and by moving around, seeing how those uh, reciprocal cells can move around in space, uh, you, you can actually find out how your truss uh, wants to move. So what are the uh, finite and infinite uh, uh, mechanisms? And we can also do that for more complicated structures. And this is um, a, a, a tensegrity structure. So this is uh, the Jensen uh, icosahedron. And uh, this actually has a, a quite pretty uh, force reciprocal. And then if we, if we start studying how all those four cells can move, that readily is going to give us uh, the, the mechanism of uh, our integrity. Um, and lastly, uh, this is um, uh, a collaboration we did with uh, a cosmologist. Uh, so I actually didn't know that um, the large scale structure of the universe can be seen a bit like a foam. So you have all those, uh, you have those galactic um, clusters where your, your galaxies are sort of clustered together. And then you have filaments which connect those uh, galact galactic clusters. And then for the rest, you have void. Um, so you, you can really think of it as, as a foam. So all the, um, all the methodologies we just discussed can actually be applied here. And then what you find is that you can actually calculate in a geometrical way an approximation of, of how thick those corridors are between the galaxies. So now uh, I'm gonna present a bit to you um, a brief overview of uh, the specialist modeling group at uh, Foster and Partners. So uh, this is a picture from people, from when people used to go to the office. So more than a year ago, I suppose. Um, so the group has a quite a diverse um, a focus of interests and that spans building physics, such as lighting simulations, uh, integrated systems, and even architectural lighting design. Um, so we're quite keen on uh, physical natural ventilation modeling, computer, uh, computational fluid dynamics, uh, wind behavior as well, uh, solar analysis, comfort, and uh, these type of things. Um, and then the second part is uh, geometry. So we're quite keen on complex geometry for fabrication, for construction, and also my particular field of expertise, which is structural integration. So how can you really integrate the form with the forces and how you can have a resulting material efficient uh, form by taking really into consideration uh, the performance. Moreover, we're quite keen on putting all this information together in a, in a very uh, uh, visual way uh, so that different practitioners uh, that uh, work, for instance, this is uh, the uh, uh, Bank of Kuwait uh, skyscraper, and you can imagine how many different contractors and people from all sorts of different expertise uh, have been working on this project. So it's very important uh, to 
have some sort of uh, visualization and data management uh, strategy. Um, so here are just uh, some uh, nice recent examples of the work of the group. Uh, this is Bloomberg uh, and had this uh, integrated ceiling for uh, passive cooling and also lighting. Uh, also uh, master plans uh, are something of interest for the group. And then also um, CAD and CAM uh, technologies like CNC and digital fabrication, especially when it comes to wood. Uh, there was a very nice project, uh, Maggie's in uh, the UK, uh, where you have those timber beams and they were uh, CNC and optimized. Uh, moreover, we're really uh, looking into lattices. So how you can optimize this type of lattice structures and uh, you might, you might uh, have seen uh, Crossrail actually in London. So what is interesting about Crossrail is that you have all those very different nodes. And actually the issue of the nodes is, is quite critical because when you want to design a grid shell, your strategy about your nodes can actually define your whole geometry. So if you decide that you want to have a grid shell where every node is the same, what, is, what are the applicable geometries um, that, uh, that you can do that allow you to have um, the same node, but at the same time have an exciting uh, grid shell form, let's say. At the same time, you might consider to have torsion-free nodes or things like that. So what, what are the geometries that uh, can allow you to do so? Um, so for the cross rail project, there were quite a few uh, different ones as you can see here. So it was uh, quite an exciting project uh, to put together. Uh, moreover, we're quite uh, interested in, um, in robotic also construction. So this is an example um, of 3D printing with concrete. And lately we're also quite keen of uh, experimenting with uh, metal 3D printing and optimization of beams. Here you see several different options. And then uh, this was actually uh, 3D printed in Cranfield University. So that uh, beam was quite long, actually. It was like uh, five meters, I think, at the end or so. Uh, and when it comes to all first design explorations, uh, quite, uh, quite a few different projects from the practice. So this is from 2012, and I think was one of the first. So back then, the idea was to have those inflatable models, and then around them, you could 3D print uh, with uh, robots your habitat shield. And the way to do the 3D printing was based on uh, an optimization method, which was um, influenced from bone structure. So you had this porous material that on the one hand was relatively lightweight, but at the same time, it would indeed protect you from radiation. Uh, this is a different option. So. Um, here, the idea was that all those modules were able to unfold and then inflate and then connect. Uh, so that was uh, the result of the interior. And then uh, when that, that was ready, you could have this uh, swarm uh, robot system, which could 3D print in layers uh, the habitat seal, uh, sealed in terms of uh, regolith. And uh, I guess now the question is, uh, how do we proceed and where do we go next? So this is something I hope uh, to be able to present to you guys uh, um, in, in the next couple of months. And I just wanted to uh, close my presentation with that. So I was just looking into some notebooks and I, I, I found out, which I, I hadn't noticed before, that actually the Architectural Association has a rather nice logo. So this is a very old one from uh, times very different to now, I suppose. But if you see what it says, uh, it says design with beauty and built in truth. So I think that that is actually um, very useful for today because on the one hand, we do have all those really vast computational capabilities and now we, we also understand that there is an interplay between the geometry and the performance and the analysis and the form and the design. But at the same time, it's not like a, necessarily a direct generative relation. So it's not that if we write the script automatically, that's gonna give us the right form, let's say, or, the, or that the most 
optimized form is the right one. So on the one hand, we need understanding both about the aesthetics and the analysis, but at the same time, it's us, the designers, that need to take informed decisions both about what design we want and what performance we want. So uh, that's all for me, I think. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Marina. Uh, that is, is a good starting point. Design is beauty, building truth. I should have written that today in the email for our <laughs> next presentation. Um, are there any questions? You could also ask Marina a question concerning your preliminary ideas. I, I have a question. Sure. Uh, how does the actual uh, preliminary project work in the office for you? Do you all sit around or is there usually an idea that you start with or because it's very too many mm -hmm. people maybe in the beginning for this to incept, I guess. I'm curious how it all starts. Yeah, so Foster General is a, is a quite big company uh, so in London, we're, I think, 1,500 people. So that's a lot of groups and each one works in slightly different ways. So um, my point is there is not a very specific way of doing things, but what normally happens is that at first the architects have an initial idea and then they come and discuss it with us at SMG that were the geometry specialists, let's say, and also the in-house structural engineers. So after first idea is formed, then let's say a, a little group is formed for its project uh, from architects, SMG and structures. And then we try all together to take uh, the idea further and integrate all those considerations about performance and constructability. Um, so yeah, I, I think most of the time this is how it works. If, if I answered your question. <laughs> yeah, I asked it because we are also in the very same position right now. We are starting the studio. So maybe I thought it would help us, but it's a good start. Thank you. Any other questions? I have a question to Marina. Marina, I, I thought it's interesting that you talk about force space and form space. Hmm. Um, is this an engineering term? Or what, when did you start thinking in four spaces? Um, so I think graphic statics is all about that reciprocity between form and force. So then that can define, let's say, your, your form um, space and your force space. Um, and what is quite interesting is that because those two are interlinked, it means that if you start doing changes in one, the other is uh, going to update automatically. But the interesting thing is also that you can directly start designing the forces. So directly start in the, this force space. And then the, the form is the output rather than the input. So it, that's quite the opposite of what we mostly do nowadays. OK, um, I would have another question. Sure. Um, so you talk about um, like designing forces um, and I don't really get it because most of the, as a, uh, if I think about forces, I, I, I think of um, loads like snow loads or wind loads or uh, gravity and these, all these loads are uh, like constants or pretty much set. And so if we talk about designing the force uh, field, um, do, you, 
we talk about the, the, the internal uh, Yeah, so I don't know if you can hear me. You're a bit frozen on my screen. Yes. Uh, cool. um, right, so yeah, as you say, for instance, we can also have continuous loading, right? But here for the case of rituals, we're mostly looking into a discrete uh, point loads. But um, one thing you can do is that you can sort of design and decide your support loads. But then most importantly, you can decide all those internal loads. So how much is the actual axial load, for instance, for each one of your beams? And that is gonna define both the sizing of your beam. So like the, the, the smallest the axial force and the less bending, the, the more efficient it is. So the, the smaller it can be. But also it's gonna inform the, the whole global geometry. So it's what we mentioned about this relation between the state of self stress. So what are your internal forces um, and how that um, really influences the, the static equilibrium of the 3D structure, given specific loads, as you say. So the vertical load is fixed and it's self-weight and it's no load or, um, or what you want. But then this distribution of internal loads gives you every time a different solution. Okay, great. Now, now I get it, yes. <laughs> Um, I might have another question. Um, you were talking about also designing in the four space. Um, and now my question would be, how is it then transformed again in form space? Is it being done parametrically um, or do you also have to then transform it manually back to form? So uh, just to, uh, to double check, your question is how to define those internal forces? Um, no, it's more because you were talking that you can arrange the force space, like the force mm -hmm. diagram, the projection, and then generate form by that, as mm -hmm. I understood it right. Yeah. And then I wanted to ask, um, how is the process? Is it being done automatically? If I change the force space, is it going to change the form um, ah. in the program? Or is it like then again, uh, I don't know, analog technique? Or... No, no, it's, so it's, uh, it's automatic, I would say, in the sense that, um, as we mentioned, those internal forces or state of cell stress are defined from the geometry of that polyhedron, right? Which lives on, on top of your, let's say, to the truss. But then um, with direct operations, you can do this reciprocity to the forces. So it's all automatic. And then by using the force density method, you can also automatically lift that to 3D. So the whole thing is interlinked and automatic. So the only thing you you can change or you may want to change is this polyhedron of the four space and then everything change in response all right thank you um i, I would like to ask something as well mm -hmm. um thank you for the talk it was really interesting and what I wanted to ask is specifically about the topics we had to research up until today, uh, self-supporting structures. And in, in my case, while experimenting, I did find plenty of examples and approaches how to start building stuff like that out of elements without any uh, special joints. But in the end, it always ended up in a dome shape just re repeating the same principle is I always got something like a dome. So do you have any um, strategies or approaches so that the 
structural principle doesn't automatically create our shape, but the other way around. So in, in which way could we um, first think of a shape and then apply that structural principle? I, I don't know. Yes, it's, it's kind of a big question, but I... I um, yeah, I mean... I, I mean, first of all, I think the reason why you would, uh, I'm, I'm not sure what were the approaches you followed, uh, but uh, I would assume that if you would end up always in the dome, dome shape, probably you were doing like a compression only approach. So at the end, pretty much is always that because that's what it wants to be compression only. So I guess the first thing would be if you want to experiment with compression and tension, in which case you start having this more like grid shell uh, and mixed uh, load paths. Um, uh, the other thing to mention is that uh, you can also start from the form um, because as we saw, everything is interlinked. So you can either start from the form or the force. So if you start from the form, you're gonna see in response, what are the forces? And then if you see that those forces are not really satisfying for you, you can change them and then in response, see what are the effects in the form. So it's a bit like an optimization, uh, geometrical uh, optimization uh, method in the sense that you start from an initial form and then by observing its forces, you sort of optimize it and, and make it um, uh, sculpt it in a sense or define its load path to be compression and tension and this type of things. Um, so yeah, I think uh, it could be also possible to start from the form space. Thank you very much. Sure. And another thing for you guys is that the, there are really a lot of different um, uh, structural design methods you can use. So you can do this type of um, uh, grid shows that have only axial forces you can uh, explore active bending, which is all about bending, but uh, they can still be, be very efficient. You can uh, look into, I don't know, uh, torsion-free grid shells. Um, there the are really, really uh, loads of things that uh, you could experiment with. We have one more question. Maybe concerning your project. Um, I will turn off the YouTube now. Maybe then we get some more questions. Thank you, Marina. I'm You're welcome. Recording.